Here's the story of a person living beside the Myra Quarry, located just outside of Fredericton, on the railroad. In 2014, the quarry was given speedy approval to do business in a protected area for environment over the third largest aquifer in Canada and to disturb the quality of life for many people living along the railroad. The whole process violated all kinds of rules and there's been no transparency and no accountability as to how that happened in the first place. Over the past six years, that quarry has been protected and no one can figure out why. But the people who live there have not been protected by the Department of Health, Department of Environment, Department of Natural Resources, or any other political means to try to get some sense of justice, some sense of accountability, some change. So here's their story, first person, like a victim impact statement. It would be really nice if you could feel what they feel and imagine what it's like to live there and to know that this could happen in your backyard just as easily. So the best place uh, to start is that you're the chair of the local service district. So logically, an outsider would think you knew all about this before the fact. Logically, you would think that, yes. <laughs> Not too much logic in this process, I don't think. Yeah, so how did it go down from your point of view? Well, uh, actually, I wasn't chair then, so I wasn't getting all the information. Certainly, uh, the chairperson knew that there was something on the go, but the government never held a formal meeting with the local service district of Estes Bridge, saying that majority of the property lies in the local service district of Douglas. But the Hall Road is firmly in the Estes Bridge LSD, so. So it's right on a boundary of some sort. Right. Hmm. And the Hall Road actually <clears throat> doesn't meet the requirements and specifications for uh, distance from from other property lines. Hmm. Yes, I inherited the file. Our our committee inherited the file with yeah. some new people involved. So. So what's it been like working on that over the past four or five years? Frustrating. Yeah. I, I you know I I guess I grew up and 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 matured with this idea that 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 local government which is elected by the people in our LSD to advise the minister would actually be part of the process and that they would actually like to talk to us about, about issues in our LSD. Mm -hmm. But I was wrong. I, I think we're just there so that they say they have that particular committee for no particular purpose. Mm -hmm. Because for five years we tried to, to get a meeting with the minister for the people in, in, in this area of, of, of the quarry, the, what we call the valley, the 40 families or so, no, no luck, no meetings. Well, we got meetings with mid-level civil servants who pat you on the head and tell you they understand, and with the uh, new minister, yeah. with the new government. And that probably only happened because our our MLA from here now belongs to the, the People's Alliance and they needed his vote. So he kind of leveraged a meeting and promised to vote correctly on something. I have no idea what, so maybe he was going to vote that way anyway. I have no idea. Yeah. So our first meeting with Minister Carr was great. He was sympathetic. He was, uh, in his past life, very familiar with uh, quarries and, and the issues around quarries, the dust, the noise, the traffic, etc. And, and he, could, he was just so excited to be able to help us. I, he could think of all sorts of things he might be able to do to, to resolve it, close it, whatever. Mm. The next meeting I actually missed, that was the meeting, Jerry, that you had with the minister and the premier? Yes. 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 So I'm not quite sure what happened there. Mm -hmm. Still enthusiastic were they or getting a little wishy-washy? Yeah. So from thence forward, uh, there have been no more meetings with the minister, no more meetings with the premier. We did meet with the premier before he was elected. 
when he wasn't the premier. Uh, but the four years previous to that, we couldn't get a meeting with any one, any of the liberal ministers or, or the premier. And the liberals refused to meet with us before the election as well. I'm not a party person. It's just that's, that's the story. And uh, now when they, we get a meeting scheduled and the minister's going to be there and maybe the premier's going to be there, then we get there and they're not there. Well, I have a pretty good idea of how much work uh, Jerry and Nat have done. I mean, I was part of some of the demonstrations we had. We took our little picket signs and we went to the minister's office. We went to the legislature. We went to the Royal Road. I think there was one other that I missed. Did you go up yeah. on the, by the Claudie? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, we got a lot of waves, a lot of toots few curse words yep. and uh, we've written a lot of letters uh, I've written letters on behalf of the LSD uh, but they don't even answer those or I get the same answer back for every letter doesn't matter what I say in it or what the issue is yep. I just get referred to somebody I've already talked to who has no authority to change anything it's the Department of Environment and Local Government that's in charge of this, but then they'll tell you the zoning that belongs to the RSC 11. So they just kind of pass you back and forth between the two. It's not too hard to get to talk to the RSC 11, but it's extremely difficult to talk to anyone with any authority within, within the Department of Environment. There are five endangered or protected species right there, uh, and they're not interested in them. So I'm not clear in my mind what the Department of Environment would be interested in. The Department of Local Government doesn't want to talk to local government and doesn't want to talk to the people involved, so I don't know what the Department of Local Government does either, but certainly nothing for the people in the valley. Um, I, I'm, I've, I've, I'm a previous business owner. I have pretty good concept on, on people who are using that quarry to provide them with aggregate. Uh, and, and we've actually seen letters uh, going back and forth, maybe between the RSC 11, City of Fredericton, just saying, uh, how about how excited the people of the greater Fredericton area are to have all this cheap rock, you know, right in their backyard. But there's a price to have been paid for that in people who live near the quarry, and indeed anybody who commutes on the Royal Road and has to drive through that they're all paying the price and people who own homes by the quarry it's worse for them but people who own homes further up the railroad etc are all giving up part of the value of their homes because it's no longer considered a des desirable place I mean mm -hmm. people come out in the summer to look at homes that are for sale and they drive through that and they go no I think I'll look somewhere else mm -hmm. so yeah. people it? whether they know it or not have paid a price yeah in the value of their home. I'm not even sure that the government really cared about the cheap rock. I think they cared about the people who had supported them politically in the past, who were involved in the project. I've not got any proof of that, but yeah. uh, I, it just seems that we get close to something and then we get shut down. Uh, the process seemed to be pretty quick by government standards to get the whole thing approved. and any conversation around issues like rerouting the Hall Road even before it were, were built, was built, was, was a conversation they didn't wish to engage in. I think it was all pretty much signed and sealed before the uh, public meetings actually occurred, so it just seems that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have a public meeting and 90 or 95 percent of the comments are negative, and then you go forward with the project period. I mean, suspiciously seems like they had already decided. It didn't matter what the people of Douglas said or felt or the people of Essie's Bridge felt or so. But right. their process demands that they have a meeting, so they had the meeting. Yeah. Well, the, I, can, I can appreciate the fact that they, they need a source of aggregate. I'm not sure they need it from that particular location. Mm -hmm. There's probably lots of aggregate around that isn't in somebody's backyard or isn't, you know, in a, va in a valley where the, the yeah. dust and stuff is going to sink down onto the homes that are there. And it's probably not that far away.
would seem that all the interest in quarrying in that area was kind of tied into the refurbishing of the Magnaquac Dam too. And people saw big contracts coming out for that. And, I mean, there, there's another group that have applied and been rejected for quarry in the same area, but time limit's pretty much up, so I expect they'll apply again, hope for a better result. <coughs> we, we had a rural plan in place, mm -hmm. which, which would mean that they couldn't put the haul road where they did, mm -hmm. but they put it there anyway. And they're not interested in the fact. I mean, there are other governance within that document that suggests that, that enhancements or industry or building or whatever can't detract f from the, uh, the ability of the persons already there to enjoy their property. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it did, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, it's not much teeth in that document. I think the biggest heartbreak is just what's happened to the people who live there. And, you know, and we can talk about those, those issues, their economic, their uh, loss of, of value, their uh, health related. There isn't a person who lives there that can enjoy their property in the summer until, you know, after seven o'clock at night, and then they have to go out and clean the dust off everything before they can sit down in their lawn chair. There's people who have to change the filters on their air conditioners like five times as often as they used to. It used to be good for the whole summer and now it's every three or four weeks. They gotta clean them up because it's just sucking dust all the time. And people tell me that they used to spend all their spare time on their deck and now they spend it indoors. Turn on the air and close all the windows. Can't tell summer from winter. Yeah, and, and there are actually standards in the province and in the country for the amount of noise that workers can be exposed to under the worker compensation, you know, whatever. I don't know what it's worker called. But they set levels. And, and for noise, they not only set levels, they set time limits. Like if it exceeds a certain level, then maybe it's half an hour and it might be three hours and it works all the way down to like 15 minutes and yet these people are exposed to ex to very significant levels of noise i'm not exactly sure how significant they are because the department is not terribly willing to to share that information um, i mean there are people at the department have told jerry that they've been told not to give him anything so, you know, in the days of COVID, you don't get much right to information requests answered. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, noise causes stress. Stress causes an elevated blood pressure. Elevated brush pre blood pressure leads to heart attack and stroke. Mm -hmm. But the nice thing for the government is that these people will not die immediately. And it will be very difficult when they do to tie their cause of death to the quarry. Um, the actual amount of dust has some other health issues, most of them respiratory, you know, and, uh, and they can also lead to death, but again, it's a slow death, so we don't have to worry about it. Mm. It's not gonna, it's not gonna be traced back to us. Uh, testing is, a, is an interesting subject, actually, because initially the people were requesting testing and they <laughs> put out, uh, dust collection equipment in areas that were upwind from where the dust usually blows. I mentioned that in a government meeting and I was told that the wind frequently blows in both directions, but I believe that in general, <laughs> generally when there is a way the wind normally blows. Now this equipment turned out to be useless because it couldn't trap the particle sizes that were concerned about. So it took three more years to get them to agree to get proper testing equipment that would test both noise and dust. But they managed to delay long enough so that it only got put out in September, which is still pretty noisy and dusty, but it's not June, July, and August when the major traffic is concerned. 
I don't know why they don't want to test because they don't pay for it. Myra pays for the testing, so I don't know why we're so upset about putting testing in place. And when they renegotiated Myra's operating permit, or permit to operate, I guess it's called, last fall, they invited us in to, to review the document. And they had a clause in there asking, suggesting that Myra might be asked, May was the word they used, to, to redo the testing in 2020. Look, I asked them to change that May to will. I begged them to change that word. So I think we knew last fall that they would not test this year. And we've been told there will be no further testing. When we asked in that fall meeting about the results of the tests that had been conducted, we were told they had been sent to the Department of Health and they would take their direction from the Department of Health. And we don't know much about it, right? We have some unofficial word that maybe they weren't very good at a non-peak period. At a non-peak period. Yeah. We have to understand that there's, you know, five to six hundred trucks on the road every day that drive past those homes. Do you think people can imagine that? No. And yet there's 40 households that have to live with that. Mm-hmm. And they're, uh, they're gearing down and braking and then they're gearing up and accelerating. Yeah. And there's the constant dust, there's the rocks that fly off. Yeah, like this one here. Uh, yeah. yeah. Hold it up a bit now. Yeah. Quite yeah, the thing. There you go. Well, how much does that thing weigh? I don't know, dear. Four pounds? Yeah. And so, you know, people used to walk their kids on the road. They used to ride their bikes on the road. And they don't do that anymore. Is this the one that fell off near the school? School yeah. bus. School bus. Yeah. So, we're down to the Department of Health, and I should uh, say that in terms of handling COVID, I have great admiration for, for the efforts that the Premier and the, and the Chief Medical Officer, and I'm assuming hundreds of people that work in the department put out to, to look after COVID and the people in New Brunswick. Uh, hats off, great job. But I have to, you know, I just run around with this perception and I must be very naive because I just run around with this perception that every life has value, but I can't seem to get people in the health department to focus on the 41 families that are dying. Yep, they're in the environment that's dying. Oh, well, yeah, but they could callously write off the turtles and the fish and the birds and the trees, but yeah, I, I can't. I can't just, I guess, can't get my head around the fact that, that the health risks that these people are exposed to is of no concern. They are obviously able to address a pandemic, which is a much larger project, mm -hmm. but they have no empathy or consideration for this issue. Now we have, you know, people like Jerry, who's getting their well water tested again, and Suddenly, it's full of stuff it wasn't full of in 30 years. And can we say definitively that the quarry is responsible for that? No. But we could say that nothing else really has changed in, geographically in that area except that. And, uh, you know, manganese is not the nicest thing to have in your water, and too much manganese, and you start to tremor. And, Maybe you get premature dementia, yeah. And, and isn't um, this all part of a very large aquifer infrastructure? One of the three largest in Canada, I believe. And, you know, just a little bit further down the Carlisle Road from this quarry was the Forbes and Slope Pit, right? And they breached the aquifer and they closed the pit down. So has, has the aquifer here already been breached? I don't know. 
but it's possible. I mean, it, it was kind of obvious at the Forbes and Slope Pit because there was this big lake of water that never dried up, no matter how dry it got and it never rained. But this could be just down the blast holes or something that all this crap is, is, is going. I don't know. Yeah. Not a water expert, but uh, gee, I would think the Fredericton area probably draws a lot of water for its residents from the aquifer. Mm -hmm. Be hoping they're testing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sure they are. Well, the only way to fix it totally would be to close it down. It's in the wrong place at the wrong time. And hopefully the environment would recover. Uh, probably not right away, but hopefully. And the people will have to do what they have to do to clean up their water at their own expense, of course. The dust would go away, and that would probably, but that's never going to happen. I mean, in, in the very beginning, and, and, and again, in, in, in the Higgs government, they've been offered uh, a suggestion that they create a road that goes down through unoccupied territory, which would take a lot of the dust and all of the truck traffic away and it would exit on the ring road where traffic is what traffic is. That would help a lot. Uh, they're supposed to do dust suppression as they're, you know, crunching and loading and stuff, but unofficially again we've been told that it's just impossible mm -hmm. to control the dust from the operation. And we always talk of it as dust, and the typical audience will think of dust in their house. Yeah. But this isn't the same dust. No, it's fine enough, though, that it doesn't get in your house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and in your teeth, and in your hair. Yeah, yeah, and on your furniture, and on your car, and in your car, and and uh, in your small engines, and everywhere. Yeah. It's almost like a flower, like a flower particulate. It's so yeah. fine. Or silicon. Well, it is silicon. As I say, there, there are our recommendations for workers who work in that environment too and and what they need to wear for protection etc but uh, the department of health has never approached the people in the community to even see if they're aware that maybe they should be wearing hard hats and and earmuffs and masks of some kind you know for 12 hours every day five days a week but they should they should they should be helping them address the health issues that there, that have been created for them. I mean, that's no way to live, but a, a constant through this story is the absence of um, the owner of the quarry. Have you ever had contact with them? Is Not personally. To complete no. that circle. You know, the circle is always through government. It's never the business person and the community. I think the previous chair chairperson maybe had contact with uh, Mr. Pembroke, yeah. but I haven't. No. And he's never come forward, Mr. Pembroke's never come forward to say, how are you guys doing now that I've plunked my quarry down there? No. No. I, I think, I think he probably knows that things aren't going well. Hmm. Yeah. And I don't know how much, I don't know what his position is in his company and how much authority he has. Uh, he would probably have financial backers of some nature or description okay. that, you know what they say when you buy a business, uh, even if you're the owner really, the, until you've paid off the bank, they call the shots. <laughs> well, that might be where he's at. I don't know. Okay. I have no, no particular knowledge, but it's a big operation, so. What is it about all this that disturbs you the most? I, I think it's that I can't really, can't really seem to get anyone to help those people address the health concerns that they legitimately have. I, I've given up on trying to raise any awareness about five endangered species because they don't care. They don't care. But they should care about the people. And even if they don't care that their property isn't worth anything anymore, and that nobody wants to live there. Even if they don't care about that, they should care about their health. 
Do you have any messages for the chairs of other local service districts? Because this isn't just, uh, you know, your geographic area issue. This, this <coughs> is a process issue that could apply anywhere in the province. Good luck. They're going to talk to the same people that we tried to talk to who are going to ignore them in the same way that they ignored us. There's no... I just had this silly concept that government wanted to be accountable. But, you know, if you go five years and you can't get one person with any kind of authority to even listen to you, and that keeps sending you the same automated response to every letter you send, it's just designed to wear you out and make you go away. It's not designed to address problems. There. Are in my mind, there are messages coming from the very top that this quarry is going to stay. Period. Mm -hmm. And eventually we'll wear out the people or they'll die. 